Let's get started, even though I know people will be coming in. And thank you for realizing that uh, this morning's uh, Center for Clinical Trials seminar is in this room, 43, mm -hmm. which it will be next month as well. Always in term, we have um, we have to leave our 2030 room and come to this room or 3030. So. You're here for February and March and April. We go back to the other room. So, um, and thank you to Vidya for uh, uh, going and rounding up people upstairs and putting up a note. So this morning, we have something a little different we're pretty excited about. Uh, we have Dr. Joe Gallo, who is from the Department of Mental Health here uh, at the School of Public Health. And um, he's a professor there. He lives in Pennsylvania. So um, he's got a commute, but last night he told me he stayed in Baltimore, which is a good idea. What he's going to talk to us about today is using mixed methods in clinical trials, which is when you put both qualitative and quantitative data together in your, um, in your trial. And it's something I think many of us uh, didn't grow up with and are eager to hear more about. His research is uh, largely in the areas of mental health, of course, and one of the areas that I was most interested in was uh, depression in late life. And he's PI of a couple of studies uh, looking at depression in late life, and I don't know if that comes into your talk at all, but it sounds like an interesting topic in addition to the methods that we're also interested in. So without further ado, Dr. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, this is like uh, Mar Monty Python. It's like, you know, now now for something completely different. Um, it'll soon be spring, just a reminder. Um, so um, I, I guess I think of, you know, mi mixed methods and um, how you um, think about mixed methods. And in a way, you have to maybe suspend your judgment or the assumptions that you make perhaps about what's what is scientific you know, um, uh, and so on and so when we think about mixed methods and qualitative um, it, it really can be a different way of thinking about science and thinking about what data is it's sort of like the movie ET I don't know if you've seen the movie ET it's a simple idea a being comes from outer space and befriends a young boy. But to really enjoy the movie, you have to suspend your assumptions about reality and kind of what can really happen. Um, so I think of that as an, an analogy in terms of mixing methods. And um, as I'll talk about, I'm on a um, panel, uh, Community Influences on Health Behavior, and we see quite a few mixed methods uh, proposals. And, I'll, I'll, I, and what I hope to do this morning is kind of um, give a little bit of the health services context that I think I work in, um, talk a little bit about what mixed methods is, why you would mix methods, and think about it in terms of trials, which, which I think maybe is a new area. And I, I don't I don't, um, I'm not up here purporting to say that I have the answers of how to do it all or that you should mix methods in, in trials. Um, but I, I think it's important to think a little bit about this spectrum of where you're operating. So from the idea of basic discovery through efficacy or efficacy trials, what works in the best conditions through to real world settings where and and even through to implementation how do things get into practice and there um the i think the importance is it starts to get very critical to understand people's perspectives or hard to reach populations and i think that's where um the value of mixed methods can come in and all the way through to to maintenance what what sustains interventions in agencies or in practices. And ideally, you'd like a practice that's based on evidence, but also that um, uh, practice-based evidence would be generated through understanding how interventions and implementations play out in primary care and other types of settings. 
So I, I couldn't resist, because this is a clinical trials group, um, bringing up this book. Is this familiar to everybody? Yeah, I, I love this book. This is a, I think it's related because my take on this book is that um, magnificent trials may be answering questions that may or may not be relevant to practitioners. Or how do you take the evidence from trials? Um, and it's not, it's not um, self-evident that, therefore, interventions will be taken up in practice and used in practice. And uh, among my favorite um, quotes from this are, like the pathologist, the statistician was consulted only after the damage was done, as one wig put it, to determine what the experiment died of. And once the clinician grasped the simple techniques that had been brought to his aid, his aid notice, the statistician has no further part to play. Along with the old soldier, he can fade away and contentedly, if sometimes, if sometimes wistfully. Um, so uh, I think that's, that might be the power of mixed methods. And, and what I like to do is talk about some mixed methods designs. This was not a mixed methods project, but um, to make the point that it does take more um, than just doing the trial. This is one that we're involved in now with a follow-up, which involved um, a 20 primary care practices in Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and New York, and was randomized either to have a depression health specialist in the practice who worked with the doctor to provide algorithm-based care, or usual care where the doctors got feedback about the patient's status. Um, it, it's, it's somewhere between a, an observational study and a randomized trial because some people in the intervention practices, you know, they may have refused to take treatment and some people in usual care may have gotten uh, antidepressant treatment or, or psychotherapy. But what we're doing now is prospect occurred over a two-year period between 1999 and 2003, that is, patients were in the program for up to two years with continued screening in the practice, et cetera. And what we're doing now is at the bar at the end with the, um, over here with the yellow, we're doing an NDI search, and now we, we recently got CMS data. So we're trying to look at patterns of service use and mortality vis-a-vis -vis, um, the intervention, which was at the practice level. The practices actually were randomized. And I just wanted to show you a couple of things that we're finding. This is the usual care. So these are people with uh, major depression. And this is survival in, um, in uh, the intervention practices and in usual care. But on the... Um, but, but in the intervention practice, sorry, sorry, let me back up. These are people with and without major depression in the usual care practices. So you can see people with depression are at increased risk of death. But in the intervention practices, their mortality experience is very similar. And what we're, what we're, that paper now is, um, we're, we're working on that to revise and resubmit. Um, and now we, we've looked at, we're trying to look at medical conditions and other conditions. Here's diabetes. These are diabetics with major depression in usual care, right? And the um, people with diabetes without depression are, are up here. But what you see in, in the intervention practices is that the um, people with, the people who don't have depression and just diabetes, now their experience is the same. So, so it looks like for diabetes, there's an intervention effect on mortality. So we want to try to figure out using the health services um, what, what might account for the difference. Now, Prospect wasn't a mixed method study. And after the intervention, none of the practices continued with the depression nurse Specialist. So that's, 
That's an issue. There weren't interviews of patients to find out what components might have been most useful um, and so on. So what I want to do is just talk a little bit about mixed methods and show you some mixed methods designs so that um, I, I can uh, maybe increase your idea or repertoire about what mixed methods or what bringing qualitative methods means. So you often get a reaction when you talk to people. Um, they either say, I've been doing, I've been mixing methods for years. Or they say, you can't mix methods because they're fundamentally different presumptions that are being made. Um, so you could think of it as this kind of um, little m or big m. But I, wa I wanted to point out that little m, oops, little m meaning um, that people are doing it informally. But there's a whole set in the last 10 or 12 years of ideas around really specifically going after mixing methods with journals, textbooks, um, an NIH work group, PCORI, has a lot of interest in mixed methods, and um, study sections are bringing up mixed methods. And I, I won't go through this in detail, but um, you can see that it comes from, uh, over the last 15 or 20 years, from other fields like sociology, and then most recently, Tasha Corey and John Creswell, um, particularly in education, and they're getting more and more into the health applications. And of course, in nursing has really a history of, of bringing qualitative in. So there is a journal of mixed methods research. There are textbooks that talk about mixed methods. I mean, this one is a good one to get started if, if someone was interested in looking. These have much more depth, the first and second edition of Tasha Corey's books have a lot of information about uh, mi mixed methods in, and in different fields. Um, Vicki Plano Clark did a, um, did, did a search looking at the trend for dissertations and for proposals using mixed methods. And you can see that um, there's a lot more uh, coming to, to NIH. And, and also this panel, which you might want to, you, you might look at with this website that are best practices for mixed methods that talk about, uh, proposals using mixed methods. John Creswell was the chair of that committee. Um, Ann Klassen, who was, who was here, um, was, was a leader on that committee. And, um, Kate Smith, who's here, uh, is, was very involved with this committee. I was a panel member with about, I don't know, 15 or 20 people that came up with these as guidelines. So what is mixed methods? Usually it's something, questions that really deal with the context where interventions are occurring. They employ rigorous quantitative and rigorous qualitative methods to explore the meaning and understanding of constructs. Um, it involves multiple methods. It's intentionally integrated. And it should frame the investigation within a philosophical or theoretical um, foundation that's driving the, the mixed methods. So what do we think of for these terms, quantitative and qualitative? Um, they're, they're shorthand. Usually quantitative studies uh, there's a single truth. You, you separate the knower and the known. That's the, you know, sort of uh, your, your, what biases you bring. Research is value-free. There's a, a big emphasis, say, on generalization. The emphasis on deductive hypothesis testing. The sample size is often big, and you can think of it as data is numbers. Qualitative methods can, can be from different fields, anthropology, sociology, nursing. Um, there's often a belief in a constructed reality or multiple truths, if you will. The interdependence between the knower and the known, the investigator themselves is an instrument, if you will. And there's a lot of value taken on 
um, being reflexive or uh, reflecting on uh, what you're observing. Oops. Often the value-laden nature of the research is, is acknowledged. The context is central. There are exploratory approaches. Often the sample size is small. And often the data is thought of as text, right? They're open-ended interviews that one is looking for themes or ideas that are coming across. So why mix methods? They're, they're using both quantitative and qualitative methods. And maybe some myths are qualitative methods equals focus groups, right? It's, it can be much more. Quantitative methods for, are for only, only for instrument development. That is a, a way that methods are mixed, but it's not the only thing. And um, qualitative methods don't involve numbers, but they can. So I don't know if this is a useful example. I'm trying to show that um, in, in my unsophisticated way that these, these terms, quantitative and qualitative, um, aren't as crisp as you might think. So I'm thinking of a latent class model, mixture models. Well, they're quantitative, certainly, because they're a statistical model. But in a sense, they're qualitative in that they're exploratory, right? You're setting the number of classes. You're seeing what comes through if it's interpretable in terms of the classes. Um, cultural consensus analysis is um, a method that, um, if you want to think of it, it's like factor analysis, except instead of analyzing items and looking for commonalities, the underlying factor, the people are the items. And you're, you're looking for common um, ways that they are uh, using a concept or how they construe a construct. So you might ask people, um, give me words that, that mean depression to you. And you get lists. You know, one person says three things, another person says eight, another person says five. And you take those lists and you are analyzing them to look at what's common. And so that's where it's cultural consensus analysis. So it's quantitative because you're analyzing the common variation shared by people, but it's qualitative because the items are coming from respondents, not, uh, not standard questionnaires, say. So I'm going to show you some things that are designs that, um, and I'm borrowing heavily from John Creswell's book, um, but we, but I think this is a good quote. You, you, in terms of mixing methods, ideally you're thinking about what do I want to achieve? What's the goals and questions of this research? And what, what makes it amenable to mix methods? So in the field I work in, um, why would you mix methods? Well, um, I think about depression in late life. And it, it, uh, the idea is that older people may express depression differently. Or people in different cultural groups may express depression differently or put different values on uh, symptoms and other aspects of depression that uh, we might not even sort of consider in a Western context. And practically speaking, it matters because if you look at this from national, we don't have to go through the specifics, but the point is these are people who meet criteria for major depression. And you could see, particularly in ethnic, uh, specific ethnic groups, not very many people, it's nowhere near 90 or 100 percent of people are saying that they're treated. And when we look in prospect, for example, this is something Jin Chu did. She's a psychiatrist from Penn, who's now at um, Bayview. And we look, so you're, you're offering the psychotherapy in the primary care office, and you see this disparity or difference between whites and blacks taking the treatment. And so um, I, I think the, the, the argument is 
that we, we want to use mixed methods to try to understand people's points of view so that we can blend it with standard ways we might think about depression. So these are reasons that are often given for mixing methods. Um, for co complementarity or completeness, there's more to the story than you can get from surveys or questionnaires. People often want to say more. Even, even in a long uh, survey instrument, they have other things that they want to say about their experience. Sometimes it can be part of a developmental process. There are questions that need to be answered that take you into another phase of the research. Or expansion or cor corroboration. Are you getting similar um, uh, results, if you will, using different methods? Um, often, this is given as a reason for mixing methods. Your, the weaknesses of each piece uh, are counteracted by the strengths of the other method. And finally, di divergent points of view. It's a way to think about divergent points of view. So by the way, for mixed methods, I, I know someone has once said, there's three kinds of people in the world, those that can count and those that can't. I, play, I said that one time at a talk, and somebody raised their hand and said, what's the third kind? <laughs> So they're, they're either weren't listening or they're, they're like really brilliant. I'm not sure which. Um, so let's just look at some designs. And then what I want to do is I'll show you selectively um, some specific projects that I've been involved in using mixed methods. Um, so there's three ways you could think about in terms of mixing methods, quantitative and qualitative. Either sequentially. You're connecting them sequentially, or you're merging two strands. And you can merge at different phases from data collection down through the inference level. Or you can embed one kind of data collection inside of another. And then what, I, what I've tried to do is think about it in terms of, of trial. So with a, with a small group here, um, we've been trying to find tri examples of trials that are reporting their trial with mixed methods. We didn't come up with a, with a lot, but I'll show you um, with my pictures what the designs were for the ones we came up with. So you could think about a trial and then a standard way where you'd collect quantitative data and analyze the data across the groups. But what would be what, what would be the points where you'd think of qualitative data collection and analyses? Well, it could be at the beginning, instrument development, recruitment strategies, modification of the intervention. It could be in between where you're trying to understand the processes, say, of care delivery or something about fidelity of the intervention. Why or wasn't it? Uh, why or wasn't there fidelity in given situations? Or an implementation research where you've got to figure out how different agencies or different practices are deploying an intervention that's been designed. And at the end, to, to understand the outcomes, feedback to improve the intervention, um, and understanding uh, mediation, potentially. So you can connect. This, this is very typical design. Right, qualitative followed with quantitative, and then an interpretation. And and often that might be used for designing an instrument. So you you you're trying to figure out what are the domains of a concept, and then those those ideas basically get turned into survey items. Um, but also could be modification of an intervention. This was one study um, that took perspectives from aboriginal mental health workers, so they're, they're dealing with vulnerable or hard to reach populations. They use it to inform the intervention design, and then it goes into randomization. Then it's like an, a, a, a randomized trial. 
So it's an example of qualitative linking to a quantitative analysis. Um, the other way, um, I have a, a, an example or two. You might have quantitative data that gets followed up with qualitative data to try to understand what you're seeing here. And I, ha I have an example I'll show you um, at the end, although it's not a trial. It's something that we proposed, or merging. Sometimes merging means that, um, and we have a couple of papers like this. We did a, a study on depression in primary care, which was mixed, and we did some of these um, types of analyses where we have themes that emerge from qualitative data, and then we're comparing people who mention things with survey data to try to characterize them. So, at the, you know, uh, example at the end, um, th there were a couple of trials that we looked at that basically did data collection at the end to try to understand um, the results. Someone did something like this, not with Prospect, but with a similar depression trial in primary care. They were looking at people who, who um, had re recovered, and, and the people talked about what was useful in the intervention to them. It was kind of, in reality, really is an afterthought, because um, they're interviewing people who stuck with the trial and got better. If it had been part of the design, maybe you would have gotten information about the intervention as you go along, what, why people were dropping out, um, et cetera. There could be examples where you're trying to understand how the intervention works. So um, there you might have a big trial with a, with a smaller qualitative component. And one example was what were, there were several trials that had that as a strategy where at each um, point where they're evaluating people, they're taking a sm much smaller sample and trying to understand how is the intervention working or not working, what helps, um, you know, what, what motivates people to continue on with the intervention. So it's an embedded um, kind of a design. And here, here, this, this looks complicated, but this, this study really emphasized the qualitative parts. And that's why I, I would put it as um, embedding a quantitative, because they, they really emphasize these process things that were going on. So they sampled from um, the two arms to look at notes that people made, transcripts of the interactions, video of the interactions, and they're analyzing that with qualitative data from, from exit interviews. So um, these are some projects that I've been involved with that are mixed. I'm not going to talk about all of them. Um, Spectrum was uh, trying to get at what depression means for older people. And it, it consists of three linked projects um, involving a survey, and then we sampled from that to, um, to do more uh, open-ended interviews, cultural consensus analysis, and we use vignettes to try to get at what people think about what depression is and what you do about it. It's not a trial, so I'm, 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 not, gonna, I'm, I'm not really going to focus on that. Um, this is a dissertation that Sue Lee worked on. She used a lot of the same methods, except it's in a Korean-American population in Baltimore. Um, this is an intervention, K, that I'm going to show you. We are resubmitting it, um, Jin, for, for June. But I wanted to show you the design, because it is mixed methods, and she's developing an intervention. Um, it did well in the first round. We, we need to resubmit it. Tailoring depression treatment using conjoint is Marcia, who's now at the University of Rochester, and she's been working on um, versions of conjoint analysis. Now, I wasn't going to talk about that either, but I, but I could. I think of conjoint, I don't know if you're familiar with that, it comes from marketing. Um, and um, John Bridges here uh, is very interested in that. He has, there's a, he has a journal patient, um, but, and he's done a lot of work with conjoint. It's inherently a mixed methods um, method. 
but I can talk about it if you want. Hillary is at um, the University of Pennsylvania, and um, we've been working on this as an R21, Implementing Care for Depression and Diabetics. I just wanted to show you the design. It's, it was funded. It's getting underway. And I, I just wanted to show you um, that. It's also intervention development. This isn't an intervention, but I wanted to show it to you as an example of going from quantitative to, to qualitative. So first I'm going to just show Jin. So, so what, what Jin did in Philadelphia in a small way is, um, the short story is she trained, um, older African American community members to deliver an intervention like psychotherapy to isolated older African American people with depression. And so the idea was, how do you, how do you, um, adapt treatment and get it to people who don't see mental health professionals? And so what she did was, she met with the patient, trained the community member, and then when the community member met with the patient every week, those were audio recorded, she would listen, and then meet with the community member and give them tips about their interaction, in injecting strategies that come from psychotherapy, problem-solving therapy, or cognitive behavioral therapy. And so she could hear over time, the community members would start deploying that um, intervention uh, or strategy with, with, on, on their own. And what patients said was, um, you know, one woman said she felt it was the best of both worlds because she met with a community member who wasn't judgmental and yet knew that behind them was a uh, professional if, if they uh, uh, got into trouble. So, so those are various roles that the peer mentor had to uh, discuss Navigating services, if, if the person then became more accepting of services, and for emotional support. And so it's an example of a quantitative with an embedded qualitative component. Now this is from the grant. I'm sorry, it's probably a little small, but, what, but it's okay if you can't see it, because it's more like um, the idea of the structure of it. So this is in the grant as a way of giving a... Um, signpost or guidepost to the reviewer so they can understand what's going to follow. But basically, each aim has a qualitative, this is the quantitative, and a qualitative component for each aim. This aim is about developing the intervention. This is analyzing that process. And I'll show you with a couple of pictures, might be easier. So the feasibility and acceptability, basically um, people in the intervention get a set of measures and over the course of the delivery with the, with, the, with the community member, you're looking at outcomes. But at the same time, there's a qualitative analysis of, of what's going on, but also debriefing the patient and debriefing the um, peer about what's happened. So that's an example of embedding a qualitative component inside of a quantitative component where you've got standard measures. So you're identifying factors related to engagement, people sticking with the program, like self-efficacy, things you measure, age, but you're also getting uh, idea about what's the process that's going on. The other part, the other aim is analyzing the communication specifically. It's taking Deborah Roeder's variables based on her system where she's, it's mostly been used with doctors and patients, what kinds of utterances people make, and what effect that has on outcomes. So it's very numerically um, oriented. Uh, we're not sure it's really been done with community members, actually, this system. Been used with social workers, etc. cetera. Um, but there is evidence, at least from one study, that what, 
what might be effective that a community member says or someone who's not a professional that helps might be different from what a psychiatrist says that helps. And, but we're going to supplement it with essentially not only categorizing it according to Deborah Roeder's system, but then listening for themes that emerge. How does it, how does the interaction take place to develop kind of a, a fuller understanding of what's going on? So not only to look at what kinds of interactions are associated with the outcomes, but to capture how, how is it working? How is that interpersonal on an experiential a level going? And, and, and we're hoping that with that, um, she'll be able to really design manuals and help with the next stage, which would be a full-fledged R01, looking at this maybe as part of um, randomizing, say, to standard treatment or something like this. Another example I'll show you uh, briefly is implementing care for depression. So maybe this is an example of merging quantitative and qualitative levels. So here's the conceptual model is th this study is about um, uh, in incorporating depression into the medical home model for diabetes. So practices are um, looking at the medical home, trying to think about the Wagner chronic care model for diabetes, and here we're trying to figure out how do we incorporate depression in, into that. And she's already done some work with an intervention that um, integrates depression and diabetes for the patient. But I just wanted to show the design. The, the, the idea is that there are intervention core components, but they only really relate to patient outcomes if it's implemented well in practices. And there are implementation core components, like coaching, feedback, etc. And the idea of the, of the grant is to look at how do different practices implement these intervention components, and how does that relate to the outcomes? And by understanding how they're doing this, we may come up with something that helps for the next phase of the research so that you can understand better how to help practices in the real world implement a change. And in the, in the design part of the grant, now it's, it's operationalizing those pieces, but there's not only a measurement component for the implementation, but she's talking to people in the practices, individually and in focus groups, the idea is then to try to understand what are the processes from their point of view, what are the barriers, et cetera, not just in terms of how are they implementing, with the idea of, of, of being able to do it better the next time. Um, this is in here because in this grant, um, so this is a grant really in a way like an R34 is often structured with a focus group and then going into the intervention. Focus group phase one, phase two, implementing what you learned. Um, but often, I've seen many of those grants, often they say we're going to do focus groups and we're going to do, we're going to learn from that. But it's not very clear what what the link is. And the idea of this table was to try to make it clear what you might learn from the focus groups that would help with the next step to make it clear to the reviewer. And um, lastly, um, this is precursors, not an intervention, but I just, um, I, I thought it was a cool idea, so I wanted to show you. It's going from qualitative data and linking to qualitative data. And, and what we're doing is um, the precursor study, these were medical students at Hopkins between 1948 and 1964. It was a study started by Carolyn Bedell Thomas. 
And the real name is the precursors to cardiovascular disease and death. It's really a remarkable, maybe untold story because it's a study and she had ideas that we take for granted now about cardiovascular risk factors. It's sort of like Framingham before Framingham, except these were the medical students at Hopkins. Their mean age is now in their 70s, actually. And roughly 700 to 800 of them return annual questionnaires about their health. But in 1999, um, we started asking them about their own wishes for their end-of-life care. And, and basically, this grant, not funded, it's been, we resubmitted it, um, the first aim is about changes in their preferences for their own care over time. The second aim is how do you think about those decisions in terms of, of how aggressive to be? And the third is about experiences of decision making from the family. So again, here's that table that for mixed methods especially, I think is really important. And, and, and actually those guidelines talk about this. Actually they, the mixed methods guidelines use a table like this that's from the first study on my list, spectrum. They use that as an example. But what I'm trying to do for the reviewer is I'm trying to show them, I have the aim, but we're trying to show them where the data comes from and what the analytic methods are to make it clear why you're mixing the methods. So this has a quantitative aim and two qualitative aims. So what I'm trying to depict here are latent class models over time. This is a latent transition model. So you're, and they, and they re classes, and they represent packages or lists of treatments that somebody might want at the end of life. We gave them a scenario that said you're brain injured, you're in bed, you, you can, you're, you can stay that way a long time, you don't recognize people. Now, if something happens, would you want in that condition, CPR, ventilation, et cetera. And the classes are um, classes where they say they would want everything, classes where they would say they is virtually zero for all the interventions. And then there's a kind of intermediate class um, where it's, it's, it's really just IV fluids, antibiotics, like comfort care. And we could talk about, uh, you know, about what, what these ratios are, but um, and then we're, then we're looking at these transitions. So we're working on a, we, we've published a paper at three years. We're working on a six year paper. But in the grant, what we want to do is we're extending it now to this long period of time. And the second aim though is going to sample, purposively sample based on the classes to have them talk about what their thinking is around their end of life care. So we think, for example, what would be informative are picking people who, by the model, are going from wanting everything to wanting nothing, say, or vice versa. And then on the other side, taking family members from people who've died and talk with them about the experiences at the time of death what happened, how were decision made, decisions made. So what we're doing is we're, we're painting this picture from the community where how are preferences changing through to uh, the experience and what they think is going on through to uh, where decisions actually got made. So it's an example of quantitative, we're using a quantitative model as a framework for qualitative or ethnographic type interviews. So we have data on preferences and service use and what happened, both from a quantitative and a qualitative point of view. So um, I just want to end with a um, couple of slides. I'll go through them quickly. Um, in terms of doing this, I mean, it's not that I know how to do it, although we, we did um, do very well with Spectrum. We had a group where we had anthropologists 
and statisticians in the same room talking to each other, which was great. It was fun. Um, but you do have different vocabularies, methods, training. Uh, people have different view. You know, anthropologists think about research subjects very differently, different views of disease, illness, different views on, on what, what's scientific. And teamwork um, means regular meetings. You kind of have to, it does force you to make assumptions that you have about what's truth and what's meaningful, explicit, willing to try on a different perspective, right, like the E.T. movie, surviving the kick in your epistemology. I mean, I find any meeting that uses the word epistemology, that's a good meeting. Um, disciplines are more than methods. I mean, people, you know, it's, it involves people. And I think it's really important for the leader to set the tone. So everybody's respected. Um, you know, nobody um, uh, is afraid to, to say what they think. Now, I, I don't have the answers to this. I thought maybe we could, we could talk about it. I could benefit a lot from hearing what you think. But uh, by the way, it says, um, um, if I don't think it's going to work, will it still work? I was trying to find um, randomized trials cartoons. Maybe you, maybe you have a repertoire or something that you can point me to. So what would be the advantages? I, I don't know, just thinking off the top of my head. You learn what participant perspectives are during the trial. Gee, you didn't, you didn't realize that people were interpreting a consent form or some question a certain way. Um, designing interventions that are more acceptable to people because you've incorporated something about their beliefs. I mean, we would call that patient-centeredness, right? Troubleshoot recruitment methods. Learn how the intervention works or problems from the point of view of the participant. Answer questions or explain quantitative findings about effects or subgroups. So I don't know about you. Actually, those, I think in the Tasha Corey book, the, there's one chapter talks about this phenomenon, which I, which I did notice um, happen where there's some results, you know, and um, not that, you know, there's some result, and you say, gee, I, does that make sense? Well, you know, but my, I can think of my, you know, something like that happened with my mother-in-law. And then you start, you know, people start talking. I don't want to name names or studies, right? But it's somebody, somebody here. But, which is fine. But, but what I'm saying is, what, instead of just us speculating, it conceivably, if, if something like that is built into the design, then you might have explanations that come from the participants themselves. Well, I'm sure there's more than two disadvantages, but I guess if you're asking people about their expectations or what's going on, right, in a, in a, in a um, randomized trial, the intervention group, the control group, maybe you introduce perceptions and things that you don't want to interfere with, with looking at the outcome. Or, um, or, or just, just putting together a team that involves, it's just, it would be more complicated. So I guess I would, I mean, I, maybe I should have asked it first. So are you, do you know of people that involve mixed methods either formally or, mixed methods I guess in a trials framework means introducing qualitative methods, pra practically speaking. So do you know where that's happened or are you doing it or um, crazy idea or what do, what do you think? I really benefit from hearing. What do you think? Yeah. It's a lot of, you know, uh, using iPads actually to do consents and do video consents. And so I'm not sure I'm not that this is happening in Florida and, and I'm not involved with this quite part of it. But a lot of it is um, uh, focusing on the consent and they're videotaping the consents and, you know, Oh, for the purpose of analyzing that. Yeah, oh. to get qualitative information about, you know, how people are <clears throat> understanding the design of the trial. I know of one example, I think it was in the BMJ, I could find it if people are interested, but the gist of it was a prostate cancer trial. And they were having trouble recruiting. 
And so they did something like that. And they found out that the men were interpreting something in a way that they had completely unexpected. When they fixed that, then the, the recruitment got better. But the, maybe there are other examples. Or maybe that kind of thing's not, you know, it happens and then it's not published. Yeah, well, they'll be comparing people enrolled in this streamlined uh, clinical trial into uh, the, a regular clinical Oh, I see. Oh. And so, and they're filming the consent process. Uh-huh. So there's a direct, direct comparison going on. Yeah. Sure. How do you present results um, when in the same study, or maybe they're not in the same paper, right. you have qualitative and quantitative um, Right. So um, often the results might be, you know, they're just different papers, right? Um, but I don't know in terms of trials. We didn't come up with a lot of trials that presented both in the same paper. There are, ex and by the way, the trials we were trying to find were only related to mental health, so there may, there may be others. But, um, but even outside of trials, often people present it differently. Now, in, in Spectrum, we did, I don't know, maybe, maybe, uh, um, maybe a dozen papers we did were actually mixed. They were mixed in the, in the paper. And so you mean, practically speaking, how do we do it? Um, well, I kind of, um, well, I don't know how far to get into my own um, personal philosophy about writing, writing papers. But um, we kind of have a framework that we used. And um, I modified the framework so that in the part, you know, where you're talking about the methods, um, you're introducing the methods in the, in the introduction and why you're mixing the methods. And then in the um, part of the paper where you might be listing and describing the measures that were used, then I have a separate section that says, instead of saying measurement strategy, it says interview procedure. And that might have more about the mix methods that were used. And then the results um, might be presented um, differently or together, depending on exactly how you do it. Um, in, in terms of the actual results. So you might, you might in, in um, uh, one paper we did, the, the results really are presented in a mixed way because there's a table that talks about the themes. We describe the themes that came up when people were talking about their interaction with the doctor. But then there was a table that tried to understand who was bringing up what theme. So an example of a theme might be um, something along the lines of, you know, the doctor only checks my heart and lungs. We don't talk about that stuff. So who's saying that? Um, so that's a simple example of mixing that. that so it is possible. It does, the, that paper is very short because it was for a clinical journal. But it's a challenge, right? I mean, and some journals are going to be more open to something that's mixed than others, I think. Yeah? Um, you seem to be doing a lot of um, explanation of your, of your methods when, when, you, when you submit your grants, or so from just from the examples here. Yeah. Um, that leads to the question, are the structures at NIH or Cori yeah. fully in place to, so in your experience, to, um, to appreciate this? Yeah. Approach? Actually, well, I, I don't know. I can only speak like the, the committee that I'm on, CIHB. Actually, I think things come up and people will wonder, you know, they'll say things like, well, I wonder why they're not doing a qualitative component here to try to. So it actually does come up. I'm kind of, in a way, I'm surprised. Now, that composition of that committee, that committee has social scientists on it, a few people. Um, like me from public health or physicians, but has also had chairs of anthropology departments. And so we've had, you know, things have been reviewed that are just ethnography. And it's okay. It doesn't get knocked because it's 30, it's an eth ethnography of 30 people. They're not dismissing it because of that. So, so, so in a way, the answer to your question is, 
Um, if it's done well, people – but it, I think it's going to depend on the committee, right? I mean, some, that is not going to be tolerated by – some committee. So you, I think you have to know who the audience is and maybe be clear about what the question, what the question is. But I don't know, you know, in terms of introducing those methods into a trial, my two disadvantages that I had, um, which I thought, gee, that's something that would be obvious that people would bring up. The first one, right? You're, you're asking people in the midst of a trial, what, what, what do you think is going on? Do you, would you worry about that? I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just to get to your uh, point about the methods. Yeah. Say the vast majority of people, someone like comparative effectiveness, we came up with a term. Yeah. And it turns out that a lot of us have already been doing it. Yeah, yeah. Term. That's right. So, I mean, if you do a lifestyle intervention study, and I do yeah. loss, right. I mean, nobody does an intervention study right. trying to do probably more informal than yeah. formal, sort of like. Sort of like right. Ask the participants what, yeah. what, what yep. interventions like, what they want, very basic stuff. But even non-lifestyle trials, I think most people do it informally. I mean, recruitment is one thing, but also right. appearance. Yeah. Sort of like, yep. you know, why are you taking your pills or whatever? Yeah. I mean, and then some of us actually publish on it, but rarely, but that may or may, or may not occur. Um, so that's more of a comment. I think yeah. most of us actually do mix methods without having putting it on our yep. In terms of mm -hmm. the disadvantage, though, I think there's one up here that you hinted at at the very beginning, which is that <clears throat> when we do mixed methods in the setting of clinical trials, we often do it sort of like partway or even toward the end of yeah. the people who finish. Right. Um, but if you're really interested in people who sort of like are dropping out or not adherent, that's right. such a tough nut to get, even early on, because right. these people basically... You know, there's almost like consent withdrawal. They said, you know, I'm dropping out of your study. I really don't want to talk to you about the reason why. Click. You know, and so that happens so often that the, one of the third disadvantages here is it tends to for biased inferences from a survivor effect. The people who are able to report at the end really are not the group yep. of people that you're interested in. Which That's, is yeah. What the front end and why they are dropping out or not here. Well, I don't, I don't think this is a... Very good answer, but I, I guess is say, well, maybe if you're like that study design where they're pulling the people out, a few people to do qualitative, that maybe if you're planning that ahead of time, you might at least get some notion, you're, you're going to get some qualitative data before they drop out, I guess. But there's, yeah, that's... Um, Especially early in my experience is that this happens very early on in yeah. randomization. If you only, before you point, they decide that this is not the right thing. The other issue, actually, I struggle with this a little bit, maybe, maybe, maybe more here. You know, I kind of spent a 10-year sabbatical at Penn hanging around anthropologists. Which, and, and, the, and the idea is this, like, what does qualitative research mean? Right? So different disciplines. So you may mean one thing. Well, we ask people why. We get a list why. But, may, you know, an anthropologist might really, they wouldn't think that was, very, yeah, you're shaking your head. So, so um, how deep uh, to go um, maybe also depends on who you can draw from in terms of discipline and, and, um, and how, how deep to get with, with the with um, the methodology and what it means to get at somebody's experience. Sure. Maybe you apply this in some of the examples before. Have you seen examples of um, qualitative data being converted to quantitative as, uh, as say, one of the outcomes of a trial, like um, taking the, an in-depth interview and having it blind, blindly read and, and re-read and adjudicated and, and yeah, no, I, so you mean like, so you're taking, qual, you know, text data and developing um, themes and then quantitizing the quality. Now you're getting into counts. Let's say a simple example would be, let's say, if you counted the, the actual words that people said. I, I don't know. Do you know of any examples? No. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, listen, th thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. I'm certainly welcome to um, other thoughts that you have. Please let me know. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me.